Viola, their mother, who was immensely respectable. I mean, I knew her really quite well. She was a sort of Cockney Queen Mother. And, you know, her boys were her bunny rabbits, and she never, you know, their boys would never do anything. And she genuinely believed it. They idolised the mother. Not so much the old man. No, they used to have their rows with the old man because he didn't like what they was doing. <laughs> you know, no one likes their children to be like they was. The old grandfather was a hero for him. He was called Cannonball Lee, the Southpaw Cannonball. He used to be an old boxer who then did musical turns. Well, he was a, like a normal thing, an old bare knuckle fighter them days. My grandfather was a bare knuckle fighter. Twins idolised it. It was honest money, hard money. And I think that was the reason why everyone in the East then wanted to box. There was a fantastic amount of kids in the area who got great pleasure going into the Craze Gym, which was a room, a bedroom. They would put up um, a, a punch bag and a ball, and Charlie taught them how to box. I think he would have been British champion quite easily, quite easily. Ronnie was beaten several times because <laughs> he never had the temperament, he never had the up here for it. After they were 16, 17, and Charlie was saying to me one day, can't you, you do something about our twins? And I said, Charlie, nobody can do anything about your twins. You know, you've got to realise your twins are quite powerful in their own way. And, and uh, no, I couldn't do anything about them. They won't listen to anybody. When I first knew them, they, I found them very uh, amusing in a way, you know. And um, though there was the, the excitement and danger around them, I, I, used, to, I used to laugh at their, at their antics, you know. I met them many Saturday mornings. They were always getting themselves nicked on Friday night and appearing in court on Saturday morning. They were the sort of thing that wouldn't go further than the magistrate's court. Things like being a suspected person, the old sus laws, and they were charged again and again with that type of crime, or trying car door handles, you know, really soppy things. Well, they got charged, they was at the Old Bailey, I think it was. I know it was a big, because they, they was young at the time. It was the first serious offence. It happened in Club Row. And they had bicycle chains and they chained him on the floor and he was on the danger list. When he punched Ronnie in the back, that changed Ronnie's attitude to policemen generally. He just, he was a bully of a man, bashed him in the back. Oh, Ronnie done him, didn't he? Crushed bang. You know, and worse thing he could have done, because he was a thick kid. And then he chased Reggie, and that, that, that happened outside Hooker's Caff the first time, on the corner of, um, of Mape Street. And then the next time, he chased, he caught Reggie, and Reggie bashed him as well, you know. And of course, he'd been up by two, two boys, two youths, he, he didn't know, he'd been up by two youths. Well, he didn't catch Reggie, because Reggie legged there, but he went round his house to nick him. And the family, collectively, said, you're not, you're not taking him in and giving him a bash, and look at Ronnie in there. Look at his face. And the governor come round with Bainton to nick Reggie. And they finally let him go. And I think, I think they got a, a caution, didn't they? I don't think they went away and got a caution. And Shepton Mallet, well, there's a good breeding ground for crime. All sorts of choice characters <laughs> that, that, that figured in their later story. When they was in the tower, Shepton Mallet, they, they, they wouldn't know worse than anybody else then. It was in when all this killing and all that come about that they got worse than everybody else. Came out of the army and um, taken over the billiard hall, which was their first venture into business. When the twins took over the Regal, it was a big place. It wasn't a small place, you know, it was a big place. Laid at the back of Marlin Station, Eric Street. By the car site on the front. They congregated there with people they met in the army, Dick and Morgan and various other people, who, people of like kind. Invariably, you got a lot of the fly-by-nights in there, you know, they always got a pair of shoes or a shirt they're selling or something like that. It was more like a labour exchange for thieves, really. If you went in there and see if anything was on offer and that sort of thing. They had people that 
sort of work for them and uh, running about for them and doing their their bidding, but not villainy. I'm not talking about none of that villainy game because they would, if they had the needle with someone, they would never ask somebody else to go and do it. They would go and do it themselves. Each area of London had its own uh, had, had, had its own organised crime group, if you like. It was neighbourhood based. They made their money from thieving, from stealing, and also from various kinds of extortion. The big area to plunder immediately after the war was the West End of London, and the main players there you had um, Jack Spot Coma, and you had Billy Hill, both men of violence, and they clashed. It was a clash over territory. It was a clash over personalities. And as far as the relationship with the Crays were concerned, the Crays were really seen as likely lads who were coming through. These were highly marketable young men who proved themselves as local men of violence in the East End of London and were being spotted by these uh, older, elder statesmen of crime as, as being uh, possible cohorts. They were in fact spot men really. Uh, originally, the story is that they were hired by Spot to defend him uh, at the spring meeting at Epsom in, what, I think, 1955. I can remember Ronnie saying, um, we're going to the races. I said, what do you know about the races, Ronnie? He said, well, not a lot. He said, but we could soon learn, and we're going with Jack Spot, and he, was, he loved the idea. He was a funny man. He used to sort of hold court in um, what the Cumberland Hotel at Marble Arch, sort of very much like sort of one of the old time mafiosi with a sort of fedora hat on and a smart suit and having his boots polished. The spot was on the decline. The men he'd had had defected to Hill, where the pickings were an awful lot better, and he eventually quarrels with a man called Albert Dimes, who was the Hill number two, and they had a celebrated fight in Frith Street where they cut each other to ribbons. I've gone round one day and there's Jack Spot, you know, this man who Ronnie was in awe of, sitting in their kitchen with Lord knows cuts on his face like nothing, you know. Oh, he looked up at me and he was sitting down and he said, I'll be back son, I'll be back. And I thought, you won't be coming back anywhere, you're finished mate, you know, your days of being number one gangster are over. Spot fell right out of the picture. What there was left of him. Yeah. Well, Reggie might say that Billy Hill was, was his role model because he was smarter, he was, in his opinion, cleverer than Spot, and, um, and he was also, in Reggie's opinion, um, more like Reggie than Ronnie. Billy Hill was the great example to them because Billy Hill was one of the few people who actually, having spent 17 years in the Nick, he did finally make a bit of money out of crime. Billy Hill was a user. Simple and straightforward as that. They were being used to use violence on other people um, for a pittance. And they wasn't satisfied with having a pit and they said, well, we'll have the lot. There was a big, big meeting held in Clerkenwell where it was decided what certain people would get, what Jack Spot was getting previous. After that particular meeting, the twins was the governor of everything. Ron was pathetic. You know, he was had a, a massive breakdown. He was he was certified and Reg always had to look after him, you see. What happened, um Ron got three years at the old Bailey and he went in Winchester prison and whilst there um he had some trouble he got certified and so he went to Long Grove, which is a mental hospital. And um, he, he decided that he wanted to have it away from there, he told me on a visit. When Ronnie was incarcerated in a mental hospital, there was a switch uh, between Reggie and Ronnie. Uh, Ronnie walks out when Reggie's come to do the visiting, and no one seems to notice that uh, Ronnie isn't Reggie and vice versa for some time. And police were called, but I never saw any police because I was called before I was called in enough to see this doctor. 
And he said, well, you're very fortunate. I can't do anything about this. He said, but you, you brought trouble on your own head, which I suppose I did in the long run because it didn't work out. Um, we called for long wasn't on any medication. Uh, so he eventually had to go back to Longbow Prison. But he had all the papers at the time, so he now must have a reputation a bit. Why Reggie done what he done to get him out of there was, was crazy to begin with. Because Roddy needed medical attention. He's always needed medical attention. Reg started the Double R Club, the Double Army's Ron and Reg, in Walthamstow, and uh, Reg became, even then, very keen on celebrities. Well, it was a big ass, that's all the Double R was. I mean, it wasn't like a club at all, it was just two big rooms. And yet Reggie always loved that, because it was the very first club that they'd actually owned. Israelders was in Knightsbridge, as, and um, I think this is one of the things that led to their downfall, because they really, well, they were off their manner. It's a big mistake, because uh, instead of leaving it alone and keeping away from there and just popping their head in now and again, they took the East End to Knightsbridge. You had second cousins to the Queen and all that going in there, all I people, all with some wrong with them, I'm sorry, you know, every one of them had something wrong with them, they liked boys, or they, if it was a woman she'd be a lesbian or something like that, you know, all cranky, all the lot of them. But Ronnie, <laughs> you couldn't sit him amongst them type of people. You know, he would stick out like a sore thumb. And I suppose the Knightsbridge set, they, they found it amusing to start with, with seeing all these scar faces and pug uglies um, roaming around. And but they're sitting down with a, with a with a East End cab driver and a Lord and Lady somebody sitting the other side, you know. And then and then of course, uh, when when uh, a few checks were were made out and they're a bit late being um, being honoured, uh, the twins wouldn't uh, two or three weeks go by and they would be around putting pickaxes through uh, Rolls Royces and things like that, you know. The next club there was the Kentucky. We said a big splash there, a lot of celebrities there, they knew one thing about them, they did know a lot of good top celebrities, you know what I mean? Judy Garland, as, as, as you know, all them sort of people. And it was always packed seven days a week, but again, the Twins never earned no money out of clubs. Because the simple reason is everyone would come in, they was buying drinks for. They put their money about, they had no sense with money, money was worthless to them, they just spent it as fast as they got it. and. and give it away. If you said to him, I like your watch, he'd you take it off and give it to you, Ronnie. He was so generous in that way. For Ronnie, it was never really about money. For Reggie, it was really about money. Reggie wanted to be a, an adept businessman. Ronnie would never allow it. Ronnie would go to where they were working and he would take whatever he wanted, whatever it was, right? If they had £200 in the till, he'd give me £150. They had loads of clubs in the finish, like piss holes. Not, not like clubs at all, you know? Uh, unauthorised spills where the gambling went on. And they had the, what Albert used to call the milk round. He used to go and collect the money from all these places. And of course, then they got in, uh, when the Americans come over, the Americans expected to pay a little bit of, um, I don't know what you call protection money, but it was just, uh, you know, sort of favour money to keep all their nuisances out. If they have any problems and uh, knockers and uh, upsetting their clubs, they could call on the twins. One big payment was a quarterly payment from the colony in uh, Mayfair, paid by the Mafia. And they was paying, I think, three and a half thousand a quarter to keep us out. They thought we were too thuggish. Mafioso talking like that. It suddenly clicked in my mind. Um, Ronnie thinks he's George Raft. And Ronnie, I think, was in love with him. But everything he did, his way of dressing, his gestures, his way of speaking, everything was George Raft, and that's what he thought he was. There they all were, in this 
background of 60s culture booming around the West End and the Chelsea set and this whole area. And they were this weird, weird pair. And the weirdest of the two was Ron, and he became weirder and weirder and more and more popular, more and more talked about, well, popular, he was talked about, he was feared, he was an unbelievable character. If a famous personality was coming from abroad or anything like that, they would take it on their back to, to meet him and be seen with him, to be photographed with him. And that in itself makes them a personality in, in their own right. How did you feel when you met people like Joe Louis? Yeah, I enjoyed meeting them a lot because they were my boyhood heroes and when I met them I was very pleased to meet them. And when the press have made a big thing in this since then, I can't understand the reason because I'm sure everyone would like to meet Joe Lewis. Whether it be present world champ today or tomorrow or whenever, past, present or future. If they was out on an evening time, they, they'd want to be have their photo done with a star or something like that. To keep them up the front, like that's all it was. They'd always wanted to be somebody's. I mean, I always remember old Ron, his great remark was, you know, better, better a somebody than a nobody. It was like a, fa a family home, you know? And it was just a small little terraced house. And uh, the twins and the mum and dad slept upstairs. Uh, there was a front room and a little kitchen, you know? It was a tiny little place. It was the cleanest, most polished house I've ever seen and decorated in the style of a, a canal longboat with pictures of Rochester Castle and roses and, you know, the, the traditional type of um, decoration. Lots of polished brass. Each interior door had a white lace curtain over it, tied back with uh, pink bows. It was r something unique. There was uh, a superabundance of kitsch, I've never seen so much, including this wonderful mirror shaped like a guitar hanging from one wall over the sideboard. Fort Valance, that was the nickname. Um, and sometimes you deserved it because they had everything in there, guns, knives, you name it, you know? I went to Fort Valance on one occasion. After we'd had a victory in the magistrate's court, I went back with my instructing solicitor's managing clerk, who was a wonderful old character called Paddy Packenham, who knew all the East End villains, and we had tea, and Violet gave us tea. And so I saw Fort Valence. It, it was an extraordinary experience, because there was a conference going on in each room, uh, over different matters, and Violet presiding at the bottom in her curlers, and she brought tea in on trays up to each conference room. Well, she was a lovely woman, a lovely woman. I mean, she's a typical mum, uh, East End mum. I took my, I used to take my kids around there, and she would get them by the hand and take them in the kitchen, give them something to eat, and make them a sandwich. And and she was a typical East End mother, and. Uh, very kind and affectionate, and I mean, she loved the, the twins like any mother. They they can't see no harm in them, and uh, she, obviously she must have worried about them and what they were doing. But I mean, they never spoke in front of her. It was always in in another room. Nothing was ever said in front of Violet. At the end, she must have sort of known what they was, you know, what they was up to, and that because you, the house was that small, you couldn't really talk in there, and she couldn't hear. People used to come out of prison, say, and knock on the door at Valence Road. Not, no one was ever turned away. No one. They always give them 20 pounds, which was a lot of money them days. I've never seen anything like it before or since. And it was Violet's pride and joy in her kingdom. No question, Ronnie Cray didn't want to do anything other than be a gangster. Um, he knew there was money in being a gangster, but the power was more important to him. He wanted to be Legs Diamond, Al Capone. He wanted to be the Colonel. 
you know. He wanted to be feared by people. He loved being feared by people. That was the kind of man that he was. When he was called the Colonel, he was the Colonel. Yeah, he had a little army of about ten people. He could call on other people, but nothing to do with a firm. They were fantasists too, so they, they loved gangster movies, they loved the idea of being gangsters. But it was very interesting once, I remember asking Ron, hey Ron, what, what, what books have you ever read that really influenced you? Got a very funny answer, he said, oh, two books, he said. One was Boys Town, because it's all about boys and I like boys. I said, what's the other one? He said, it's uh, Anthony Nutting's book on General Gordon. He said, I love General Gordon, he's my hero. So I said, why? He said, because he was gay like me, and he faced overwhelming odds and died like a man. Ronnie wanted Reggie to be like him. He wanted him to think like him, and, and Reggie wasn't that type of person. He, he wasn't... Reggie could have an argument with you, like everybody else, and he could hit you on the chin, walk away and forget completely about the argument. Ronnie couldn't do that. You know, Ronnie would, mentally, he would, he would want to really hurt you, and hurt you bad. Ron was terrifying, he wanted to be. He really could look so evil. I mean, to hear Ron say, you cunt, was in a way no one has ever, ever said it in my life before. You wouldn't insult Ronnie. You wouldn't say one word about Ronnie. Because if he heard of it, he, he would come looking for you, yeah. He'd have um, a couple of midgets to come along, you know. Because he had a touch of circus thing, of the old East End circus stuff, you see. And these midgets would come and say, uh, Hello, they'd say, you know, we're friends of Reggie and Ronnie. If you don't tell the truth about us, we'll kill you. Bang, bang, you see. And the pub would roar with laughter at this. Ronnie Cray was insane at certain times in his life. He suffered from paranoid schizophrenia, which isn't, if isn't controlled by medication, is very dangerous. He was partially sedated by a, an old East End doctor who I used to know, called Dr. Blasca, who used to prescribe pills to him, and they weren't the right pills, and Ron would come out of this state, but he wasn't properly sedated. Blasco looked after him ever since he was about 17 onwards with pills, yeah, every single day. Well, it quietened him down, there's no two ways about that. I mean, from a raging lunatic, he would be sitting there like a zombie. He wasn't the same um, person one day as he was the day before, you know? And the influence he had over Reg, uh, in my opinion, um, was great, you know? And not only Reg, 90% of the other people in the East End that he worked with, you know. Not so much Reggie, he wasn't too bad in that respect. It was Ronnie. Ronnie was looking for a kill, kill, kill. Uh, Reggie was more business-like, a bit more sensible, but violent. Don't worry about that, he was a violent, vicious man, but it was more directed. Uh, there was more reason behind his violence. <laughs> well, Ronnie, done it for fun. Went to rest from the oldest barn in Knightsbridge. When I walked in, I walked into a kitchen. And Ronnie was standing opposite there, opposite me as I walked in. And when he turned, that's when I see these, well, I call them pokers, but they were cold steels with their sharpened knives on. You know, he had them on the gas. And I thought to myself, oh, he's trying to fight me like, you know what I mean? Anyway, he's come over with a poker. And he started burning my hair off. You know, I had thick curly hair then. And he came up to me and he just went, Psh, like that. And then he put it across there. And uh, then he took that poker back and he went back and got another one off and he held it across my eyes there. And I shut my eyes then. So he said, o open your fucking eyes, he's saying to me. Oh, it's so blimey. He said, now I'm going to burn your fucking eyes out. Now, all this is melted now. And uh, someone at the back, they just shouted out, no, Ron, not that. 
and he just, like that, switched off. He walked away. He said, right, you can go now, as if nothing had happened. You had to be on your guard with Ronnie, like 99% of the time, you know? Because, as you say, he, he was never the same, you know, one day to the next. Ronnie had given me a gun in a club in the West End. He wanted Connie to be shot. He said, don't shoot him to kill him, shoot him in the legs. Connie was in the toilet then. And I went in there and I said, Ronnie wants you shot. There's the gun. Got out of the toilet quick and that was it. I went back and I says, he's gone out. But there was many a time that Ronnie and Reggie spoke about knocking uh, Connie off. A week later, he'd be changed his mind, and Connie would be back on the firm. That is how the, the Colonel, Ronnie Craig, carried on. Just lunacy. Ronnie was getting too violent, and right, all Ronnie wanted to do is hurt everybody. You know? Um, couldn't be happy to get up and have a, day, a night out or a day out uh, without someone's got to get hurt somewhere through some ludicrous thing, you know? I walked up to the bar and stood there, said hello to a few people who I recognised, bought a drink, and I noticed people drifting away from me, left and right, and I knew something was going on. I turned around, Reggie's trying to cop an automatic pistol, if you don't mind. The next thing I know, bang, I'm shot in the leg. Times and time again when we went to clubs, uh, if Ronnie seen a stranger in, coming into his domain, he didn't like it. He would make a point of going over and sticking one right on him. And it didn't stop there, it was a, it was a kicking. We all stood by, we wouldn't grab Ronnie because Ronnie would do you. Ronnie was a nutter. I'd met a man named David Litvinov who had upset them. Uh, he was a good informant of ours, but we didn't run his name in the paper. He, was, he told us a lot of what had gone on. Uh, Litvinov had his mouth widened with a sword. Uh, I understand that Ronnie had held it in two hands and done that to his mouth while somebody else was holding him still and widened his mouth. And it was a gesture that he'd made to him for something that David Litvinov had said. And it was a case of, well, if you're going to use your mouth like that as a big mouth, I'll show you what a big mouth looks like, and cut his face nearly ear to ear. The extraordinary thing is that David Litvinov was in hospital. Two days later, Ronnie came and visited him, brought him flowers, and said, I hope you're all right, I hope you'll recover soon. That was the man. Ronnie was in this club and, and, and the guy came up to him and said, Hello, Ron, how are you doing? You're putting a bit of weight on, aren't you? And Ronnie made some remark, then went out of the club, got in his car and was driven off and he said, Hang on, turn round. And they turned round and went back. It just shows how cold and calculated and then anticipatory he was about what he was going to do because he went back into the club and he said, Come here, you took him in the toilet and striped him down both cheeks and they called this guy Tramlines, that was his name after that. Some people nearly died, you know, we would have to wrap them up and sun it to sort of stem the blood and then take them, drop them outside the London hospital or something. And uh, that, that was regular, regular thing. Little Mickey Morris um, they beat the life out of him, like the two of them, you know, um, for no reason whatsoever. A young fighter, a young ex-fighter, one of, one of Ronnie's ex-boyfriends, again, upset him for some reason, and he just took a Gurkha knife and just started hacking into him. Practically killed the kid. Mm. Face, head, hand, back, wherever it was possible to hit him. I think he wrapped him in a bed quilt, some sort. And again, dumped him outside the hospital. Could have died from loss of blood if he hadn't been picked up straight away. 
mean, they were always fighting. Ronnie and Reggie was always fighting. If the crowd was round the pub like that, and Ronnie and Reggie was there, if an argument was starting between Ronnie and Reggie, the crowd would gradually and gradually move right out of the way. They didn't want to get involved. If they got involved, the two of them would turn on them. That's how they were. They might be raring about something on the morning, and they'd come in the snow roll. Then all of a sudden, one over the other would start lashing out at the other one, and they'd be fighting, yeah. When they were round, they were like two two girls round, you know, like your sisters over boyfriends or makeup or something like that, or their brooms. They just used to scream and shout at each other. One day, Ronnie was um, having a go about Reggie's wife, and Nobby Clark, fool as he is, he joined in. So now, nothing was done straight away. They, they didn't work like that. It would register. And they would save it up, use it when it was time. Between 12 and 2 in the morning, Reggie was stinking drunk and Ronnie kept going at him and saying, why don't you go over and get that little bastard? Go on, get a gun and go and shoot him. So we went over there, Dobby's coming down the stairs. And I said, what are you doing this time? What do you want? What do you want? Can't you see me in the morning? He never dreamt what was going to happen next. Reggie put the gun up to shoot his head off. I got a hold of Nobby and I punched him and he fell down. Reggie shot him but it ended up going in his foot on his leg. I think Francis had a, had a raw deal. She'd have been better off not to even got with Reggie in the beginning because you can't take a person from normal environment and put her into an environment like that. Before they even got engaged or anything, I was on a boat with him, going to France, and uh, he'd bought her a, a lovely necklace. And they had a rare, and invariably their rares was only over the, the family and the way that they treated Francis, and she had good reason to. You know, they didn't treat her nice at all. And what happened was she ripped the necklace off and threw it overboard. <laughs> Francis wanted a different life than she didn't want to be out all night long in clubs and things like that. You know, she didn't want that. There was just a, a, a colleague of mine and I went to the wedding of Reggie Cray and Francis Shea. Reggie entered with his bride and a hymn was struck out by the organist, which the congregation didn't know. I could see Ronnie Cray, who was best man, uh, becoming very fidgety in his pew, and he kept turning round uh, with an irascible look in his face. The organist played on, and Ronnie finally got up and strode down the aisle, and he said in the loudest stage whisper, Sing! Fuck you! Sing! They wasn't left alone to be like be husband and wife. Um, he couldn't stay another night like an ordinary person could. It'd be a phone call and he'd have to go to this pub or that club and, you know, or Ronnie would want him and... It was like, really, having a... <clears throat> if you're married into a big family, having a family interfering in your marriage. And that's what it was like with him and Ron, you know? The hostility was there the continuous because Ronnie used to really, really go to town with her, you know. Reggie told me he didn't know how to touch a woman, to excite her. Didn't want to hurt her. So he said, didn't want to hurt her, didn't know how to touch her. It's a shame, you know. Francis' mother revealed that her daughter's marriage to Reggie Cray had never been consummated. The marriage quickly fell apart. When she broke up from him, I had to drive Reggie around to that house four or five times a week and used to throw little stones up at the window. She wouldn't come in the window a few times, but then once or twice she would come and we'd just go, leave, go away and leave me alone. She just didn't want it on.
massive show funeral. Buried her in a wedding dress. Open coffin. My main job on that day was to make a note of everybody who we knew who hadn't sent flowers, uh, which I thought was pretty sick myself. There you go. When Francis died, but she lived in our house for about nine months, you know. <coughs> and um, that we tried to help him through his, you know, his bereavement, you know. I think he was so much in love with her, it just, you know, it really broke his heart, you know, when she died. Reggie thought so much of France, he's a, his life ended. That's the way he looked at it. Told me so out of his own mouth. For some time, the craze had been competing with a rival firm from South London, the Richardsons. An all-out gang war was imminent. Ronnie he always wanted to shoot somebody who was in the firm from across the water. He hated the Richardsons, absolutely hated them. He always thought that the Richardsons would come along with the guns and they'd be a right shootout. We'd all been paired off, given a name, an address, where they drank. Girlfriend's house, wife's house, all that information. And we were just waiting for the off. The call to arms never came. The Richardson gang were involved in a shootout at Mr. Smith's club in South London. There was a desperate fight uh, in March 1955 uh, between um, Eddie Richardson and Frankie Fraser, who were business partners on the one hand, and uh, some people called the Haywards and their friends on the other. More or less everybody who'd been in the club uh, was charged with a fray, and that took out, really, most of the Richardson, if I can say, team. George Connell was one member of the Richardson gang not present at the shooting. When the Richardsons went down, that's when they went after Georgie, you know. But I don't think they'd have done it if the Richards was, wasn't in prison, you know. Because he was on his own now. All the others were away. He was, a, he was a, on the pavement, fire George. He could, he could have a rare George. Yeah, couldn't he, Tom? He could, yeah, yeah. Uh, and he had no fear. He was the only man, I swear to God, that I ever see. He came into the Grave Morris pub, you know, one day, and... Uh, he, Ronnie's with his little boys, you understand? And uh, he came in on his own. The firm are there, if you like, all the crap, and, there's, uh, and uh, they went to get him a drink, and he went, no, 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 he said, I don't drink with uh, the, you and your little puffs. And had his drink and walked out. But it wasn't long after that that the old now was gone in the coffin, yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. And it was, uh, he was on top for him, you know what I mean? What happened was the next night, uh, after the fight, Cornell goes to visit a man in hospital in North London, and whether out of bravado, whether out of just recklessness, or whether he never thought anything was going to happen at all, goes into the blind beggar. Ronnie Cray went to the pub with Ian Barry and Scott Jack Dixon, and shot Cornell dead. He says, drive me up to the blind beggars. So as we're going up there, he sticks a gun in Ian's hand and says, here, put that in your pocket. And he tells me where to pull up. He goes in, he couldn't have been in there any more than about three, four minutes. The guns went off. Ian didn't know what to do. He got out and he shot in the ceiling. I could never understand why he went down for murder. Ronnie gets into the car, so he's laughing his head off. I've done it, I've done it. I've actually shot him. I've shot that bastard Cornell. I just done the bastard, he said. Drinking in our manner. Took it like, as a bit of an insult. He was quite convinced that he'd done the right thing and sorted him out. I know Charlie Richardson in his book said that Ron needed his sacrificial victim. And I think, you know, Charlie Richardson, who was a smart guy, he got it right. I think he was his sacrificial victim. Hey, to get shot for calling someone a fat puff. Well, that just shows you the state of Ronnie's mind in the end, you know. 
We had a girl, a nurse in a London hospital, giving us hourly updates. Uh, and she told us that he'd been transferred to another hospital, a neurological unit. Then at half, I think it was about half three in the morning. We got the message he's died after all. This little cheer went up from the crowd. And that was it, that was the end of Cornell. After Ron had killed Cornell, what does he do? He goes into his flat, holes up, hiding from what he thinks is after him. In fact, they weren't after him. Playing records of Winston Churchill's wartime speeches. Well, that's no normal murderer. That's very weird. And they were weird. Everybody and his friend knew Ronnie Cray shot Cornell. He didn't hide it. Um, the authorities knew they couldn't find anybody to pin it on um, because witnesses, lack of witnesses. Cornell, there's no point in shooting the poor bugger. No point at all. You know, the, the war, supposed war with Richardson's was over because the Richardson's were all in the nick by then, so there's no point in going and shooting him in the blind beggar. But it was necessary for the cult. By December 1966, the Crays felt invincible. To enhance their growing reputation, they hatched an audacious plan to spring one of England's most dangerous criminals from Dartmoor Prison, Frank Mitchell, the Mad Axeman. He had been in the system since he was about 12, and he'd never been out of it. His first conviction was for stealing a ferry cycle. And the dreadful thing was that from that moment, his life had a ghastly inevitability in it. He, it. he went to industrial school, it was called, in those days. But what now would be a secure accommodation. And then he went to Borstal and he went through the system. He never got out, but every time he entered a new institution, he got into more trouble within the institution. He'd been flogged and birched and incarcerated for most of his adult life the most recalcitrant of all prison uh, offenders and then it suddenly turned completely into a cooperative and and uh, yielding kind of a, a prisoner so that he was able to go on to a, a working party for a con he had a pretty good life on Dartmoor come and go as he pleased uh, they give him a sort of free reign free reign like letting him feed the ponies. They were taking girls down there so that Frank Mitchell could enjoy them. And they were taking money down there to, so that he could go off. And when he was supposed to be working on fences or under the supervision of a prison officer, he was off to Tavistock to buy another budgie. Most people, they say, oh, I'll be out in four years, three years, two years, whatever. They know their release date. But Mitchell didn't. He was complaining about this and Ronnie said, don't worry, we'll get you out. Come and work with us. Mitchell was to be brought out of prison to join the gang in order to give weight to, to their, uh, to their uh, firm when they enjoined in their battle with the Richardsons. In, in March, the Richardsons had this fracas in, uh, in the Mr. Smith's club and they were all wiped up and so the need to bring Mitchell out was gone. On December 12th, 1966, the twins sent Albert Donoghue and Teddy Smith to the West Country to pick up Mitchell off the moor. The day we picked Mitchell up, uh, we came up from London, came off the Exeter Road, over the hill here, parked up here, as was already planned. But in actual fact, we didn't think it was going to happen. But uh, Teddy Smith went in the phone box to uh, as a reason for being here. At about 20 minutes, and then Big Frank strolled around the bend here, as though he owned the place. In the car, Got him changed, took a big, bloody great Tarzan type knife off him. Then we packed all his prison gear up and chucked it over a hedge where it was found a couple of days later. 
and we were home in London for it was on the radio. The authorities launched a massive search. The craze arranged for Mitchell to hide out in a flat tended by Scott Jack Dixon. He was only in the flat when I went in. I put my hand out as if he was a long lost friend because we'd already heard so much about Frank. He was a giant of a fella, a bit simple in his ways. Uh, I dare say that you couldn't pick a fight with a man like him. I don't know why the twins thought they could control him. When all the authorities, psychiatrists, mental institutions, Rampton, Broadmoor, they'd all failed. That they, for some reason, thought they could control him. But they couldn't. Mad Teddy Smith, who was the driver on the Dartmoor pickup, fancied himself as a bit of an author. And uh, he would go there every day and write these letters to various newspapers, uh, politicians and, and that sort of thing. All we wanted was a few letters to go to the newspapers and say, I'm quite prepared to come back if I get a release date. When we got the first uh, letter printed in the newspaper, so I bought papers and fetched them back in. And I says, look, you're in the news again. Oh, great, great. Oh, they'll soon give me a date, nor is it. Poor soul, never got a date. The days went by and he was getting restless, very, very restless. Anyway, I went and I seen Reggie. I says, Reggie, somebody's got to come over and see him. He's doing his nut and he wants to see one of the twins. He just said, would you like a young girl, Frank? You know, like calm him down. And he said, oh yeah. She was an hostess and like many hostesses, unfortunately, are like prostitutes. So she was there to give him a service, and she, which she agreed, uh, and she got paid for it. Once he got the girl, most of the time, he stayed in bed having sex. He used to get the meals in bed, both of them. And Frank fell in love with her, and in a way she liked Frank. They say she was kidnapped. She could have left that flat. It was only an ordinary council flat. She could have left there any time she wished to. I mean, he had to sleep. And while he was asleep, she could have got up and walked out the door. We wouldn't allow her to use the phone. But she was a prisoner. Not that she knew about being a prisoner, but she was a prisoner. Because Frank didn't want her to go. Then he started getting a bit edgy. And he said, um, if the twins didn't come and see him, he'd go and see them. He knew where they lived because he'd been writing to him when he was away. And they took this as a threat. And uh, this plot was hatched. Get rid of him. They had their reputation uh, to live up to. And if they offered him up to the police and got him arrested and sent back to prison, how would that look and how would that stand? So Ronnie being Ronnie, he, he wanted him to uh, disappear off the face of the earth. I could perform these sort of tasks without any problems. And I've always said, I said, well, this, this is the last one. When I said, you know, I'm not getting involved in any more after this, you know, this is it. I said, um, do this one favour for me, you know. And uh, it was Christmas, building up the Christmas week, and uh, I've got a business to run, I've got kids, I've got the booze to look after, and uh, all the things that were going on at the time, uh, bits of agro indoors. I mean, uh, you get all this, and then this is on top of it all, you know. It's the last thing I wanted, uh, I needed to do, or be asked to do. I was very reluctant, really, but. Um, Give me word, and I said I'd do it, I'd take care of it. It was a plot between Charlie, Reggie, Freddie Foreman. I was present in the house, but not in the room. There was another guy, a guy who owned the house. And then they came out, Charlie came to me. He said, I want you to meet Freddie, Cannon Town Bridge make arrangements to get 
Mitch you out of the flat because he trusted he trusted me and I got him off the moor. So I was used to get him out of the flat, separating from the girl. Telling me he's going to the country to have Christmas with Ronnie. And Ronnie don't want any women running around the place. He went for that. Let him out of the flat, into the van. Uh, he left the flat with Frank Mitchell and walked around the corner. And uh, he was t to just put him in the back of the van and walk, go back to the flat. Why, for whatever reason, he climbed up in the front, I don't know, because he wasn't supposed to do that. On the left-hand side is Freddie Foreman and Elfie Gerrard. Callahan gets in the passenger seat. Once the door slammed, he started firing. Then, uh, um, he's, Mitchell's still moving and groaning on the floor. So Gerrard said, I'm empty. Give him another one, Fred. Now he leaned forward and pop done him behind the ear. The situation in the van got out of hand and uh, it had to be done there and then. Yeah. It wasn't that, wasn't the plan. It, the plan was to uh, get well down the road. But uh, things don't always work out as you expect. We all heard the shots. And we commented on it. Well, Lisa was the first. She screamed, they've shot them, they've shot them. She wasn't a fool, the girl. I got out of the van, all right. Walked away. Still wasn't quite sure whether I'd get one in the back of the nut or not. But. Five minutes, maybe less than that, Albert come back and says, he's gone now. Get your gear, Lisa. I'm taking you to Reggie. But Albert assured her, nothing will happen to you. I briefed her, I said, when you go and talk to Reggie, don't mention bangs, otherwise you'll go swimming. I said, you just go there and say, you say, where do you think Frank's gone? Say he's gone to the country to be with Ronnie. That's what he told me. And leave it at that. I said, if you start talking about bangs, it's all over. Anyway, she passed that little interview. And she survived. He cried. Yeah. So that's how much Reggie was knew about it. He broke down and sat on the stairs and cried. Eleven days after Mitchell's escape from Dartmoor, Foreman, with the help of a trawlerman, disposed of the body at sea. Ronnie's thirst for murder was out of control. Reggie found it increasingly difficult to resist Ron's violent demands. In October 1967, matters came to a head. A local villain, Jack the Hat McVitty, had upset the twins and was unfortunate enough to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. I didn't like the fellow McVitty. I wanted to get rid of him. I hated everything wrong. Uh, he's very uncouth. He's very uncouth. Um, he's loud and aggressive, which I find is a vexation to the spirit. And um, indeed, he was just saying there was some um, sort of firm thing I despised. Whenever I see the film uh, Mean Streets with De Niro playing the part of the guy with the hat who causes all this mayhem. That's Jack the Hat, that character. When I look at it, you know, it, completely untrustworthy. He didn't care tuppence about them, Jack. He wasn't frightened of them. No. And uh, this is where he was an embarrassment to them. The craze tried to put him down, like, oh, he's no, no, nothing, like he's a, a drunk and a tuck, he ain't any thief. And he, well, he was a bloody good thief. I like Jack, his character. <coughs> and um, he won a grass. He could be very violent, um, but he was more more of a sort of joker than a, than, than a serious person, you know. Jack was a nuisance. There's no doubt about it. He was a pest, and um, 
I mean, he, uh, everywhere he went, there was a trail of destruction behind him. And he, and he was on those Dexedrine tablets, you know, those little pills that was about in those days. And uh, just another form of speed. And he, he was speeding uh, every day, morning, noon and night, you know. I remember, I remember going round to his house once, for some reason, I don't know why. And uh, I sat there to have a cup of tea, uh, obviously at the fireplace. And I looked up over, over the top of the fireplace, and there's all these bullet holes in the in the fire, you know, in the chimney breast. And I said to his, his wife, I said, "What's what's all that? What's happening?" He said, "Oh, that's when he gets drunk. He he lets go at the chimney, you know, with a shooter." So uh, I thought, "Hmm." We was in the carpenter's arms, the pub bed then, at the time of the East End. And uh, there was no sign of any agitation, no problem. There was Ronnie, Reggie, it was all there. Even their parents were there. So there was no thing, and we left with two other men, me and my brother. And by chance, we happened to go to the Regency. Sea. Who should turn up? Jack the Hat. Ah, oh, let's have a drink and all the rest of it. No, we're all right, Jack. And so there's loads of people. I get a phone call from my doorman saying Reggie's in the foyer, could I go and see him? So he's got Ronnie Hart and Ronnie Bender with him. So he said, uh, Jack's downstairs. He said, I'm going to kill him. So the next day I'm called upstairs in the office by Tony Barry. And there was Reggie and Ronnie Hart. He just says, uh, bring, we want to see Jack. Is he down? And I went, yeah. And bring him to a party. But at no time did I know anything was going to happen. Tony Lumbey, I was going back to look after Jack the Hat. Reggie's pulled a gun out in the office and said, look after that. He's give me, this, give me the gun. As he did that, Ronnie Hart's pulled out a great big dagger, like a great big kitchen knife, and said, yeah, hold that as well. So I put him in the office drawer. About 15 minutes later, Hart's come back. She asked me for the knife then. I gave him the knife. Said, uh, uh, Reggie wants you to take the gun round to Blonde Carroll's. So I said, well, if you don't take it round there, Reggie's going to come back and he's going to shoot Jack in your club. Well, we knocked on Blonde Carroll's door. Go down to the basement. I handed Reggie the gun. I've gone back to the club. Jack goes round to the party. And that was the last we saw of Jack. I would never put myself in that position again. It was wrong what happened to Jack yet. I'm going to say that. It wasn't very nice. He didn't deserve that. You know, if they had that argument with him, don't involve no one else. We go along to Blanc Carroll's, thinking there's going to be this party, going to have a bit of a time there and get on to the West End. We go down the steps, go into the room, Jack runs in, where's the party? I see Ronnie standing there, and uh, these two fellas dancing. And all Ronnie did was bars past me, hit him with a, a, a little glass, along and he went, oh, fuck off you, cunt, I've had enough of you. Bit of an argument starts between Reggie and Jack. Reggie pulls a gun out. I think he's going to frighten him. You understand? Goes click, nothing works. That was the first time I seen the gun. That was the time I seen nothing. And it didn't seem to me that they knew what, was, what they were doing. I can't handle it. I walk out of the room and Connie White comes to me and I'm, I'm really upset. I'm, I'm torn between frustration, anger. When it, they said that Ronnie was urging on doing Connie, it was not Ronnie Quay. I had no need to protect Ronnie Quay from anything. It was Ronnie Hart who held him. And he had him right in the, beyond, he had his arms pinned back. And was urging really to do it. I can't go to Jack's rescue. If you want to know what I really felt, I felt a coward. It's hard. I never see the knife. I don't know where the knife come from. It was over before it happened. And Ronnie came out and said, uh, what's the matter with him? And Connie said, well, he's upset about all this. Ronnie said, take him home. It didn't seem real. It didn't seem real. And next thing is, cool, people are going everywhere. What had happened between him leaving that pub and meeting him at the Regency, something happened in that short period of time, in an hour. I had a bit of an argument with wrong, didn't I? I can't think of wrong, didn't I? And it spurred me on, you know. 
The guy was at the edge of a nervous breakdown. His wife had just killed herself. He was drunk. He was drugged. He was dominated by his homicidal old twin. These were all the things that it was about. He stood there, and the words he says to me, "Fucking get rid of that fire on the train." That was it. Now I'm in the now I'm in the picture, fully in the picture, and it's not even my argument. Nothing to do with me. If he, if he was a, something wrong with him, yeah. A lot of the people around, I think, were involved, and they were drinking too much. A lot of the other characters in the scene, um, who I won't name, I think a lot of other people do. It was a it was a mess. If something got out of hand. It should have been controlled. Shouldn't have happened. McVitie was stabbed to death. The Lambriano brothers, along with Ronnie Bender, were left to clean up any trace of the murder. I went upstairs, and there were two little kids asleep, long Carol's, Carol's children. And I went in there. I gently took the eider down off their bed. They had a, not a duvet; they had a kind of a, a cover. There were blankets underneath it. And I took it downstairs, closed the door gently, took it downstairs. There he's lying on the floor. Now what do you do? We rolled him over, and underneath him was all this congealed. The nearest I can think what it was like was if you went along to the butchers and you bought some liver. There was all this kind of livery stuff, a lot of it and all, which was like congealed blood. And we wrapped him up in the night down and got him up the top of the stairs and got him in the back of his mower. Put the body on the back seat of the car, locked the doors, then we went back into the house, finished up doing what we had to do. Then came the time of uh, a big question mark, who was going to drive him away? There was an argument about who was going to drive him away. And rather than arguing, I said, I'll fucking do it. Amongst all that madness, that night, for somebody to say, I'll drive that car over to South London, you took, uh, you know, took a lot of courage to get behind the wheel of that car. They followed me. And we just wanted to get rid of it. No set plan to put it anywhere. We lose him coming up out the tunnel. And it's fairly ironic, this, that we, we drive around for maybe about 20 minutes looking for Tony, and we finally found him. The car, Jack the Hat's car, had run out of petrol right outside a church. When they left it there, they went back to told Ronnie, that's when he, he screamed his head off, you know, you've put it right on Fred's doorstep, which, um, it look, makes me, Im implicated me, and then knowing that I'd had a row with Jack at the casino when he pulled a knife on a crew pier some months earlier. It just seemed that over South London there wasn't a lot of love lost between us, that uh, it could be left over there and there'd been a killing in South London the police would be looking there rather than in the East End. By coincidence, I could have been anywhere. It could have been anywhere. To me, that's another world, it's not a do like. It was never done. It was just one of them things. We dropped Ronnie Bender off at, uh, over the other side of the Blackwood Tunnel down in Popular. What we weren't to know, that Ronnie went and found Charlie Cray and told him he'd done it all. We weren't mentioned. Instead of getting a pat on the head, Charlie blows his nut because whatever, he didn't want that body over the East End, over the South London, that put it firmly on somebody else's doorstep, on Freddie Foreman's. Again, Freddie Foreman was asked to dispose of the body. Reggie had committed a very public murder. It was Cowley and Hart who came over to my pub, knocked on the door and uh, got me out of bed and said, there's a car been dumped, Jack's body in it. And so I had to break into the car because the, the car had been locked and um, the keys had been thrown away. And it was just uh, breaking daylight with the rain, it was a rain, thankfully it was a rainy morning. And I looked in the back, and, you, and anyone walking by the car would see that, that there's a body laying on the back seat. I mean, it's only wrapped up, in, but the shape of the, the person was there. 
and um, there was all the old cleaners going to work that time in the morning, but they had their heads down because of the rain, you know. So that was uh, uh, convenient. Switched lights on. And my pal was across the road, tailing me off, minding me off, and he, he, I got it going. I got the car going, and uh, the windscreen wipers wouldn't work. Oh well, that's nice. It was a wreck. The car was a wreck. So I've, I've got a, I took a liberty with myself driving out away from there. Took him down, down to New Haven way, to put him out the seat. So he had uh, the uh, burial seat, and I saw the condition of him, uh, and there was none of this cutting throats and pinning him to the floor, boards and things like that. He had a couple of stab wounds in his back and and uh, front, you know. It wasn't as bad uh, as what um, as gruesome as what they they portrayed. And I fully expected it to be found the next day. And when it never got found, I, I thought it didn't happen. You start to think that way, it baffled me. Oh, it was within within a week, within that a few couple days, days, couple yeah. of days. That was that was history, if you like. You know, couple I mean, uh, them sort of things uh, they spread, you know, like wildfire. You know, what I mean. About a week later, we had a meet, they, they'd gone up to Suffolk apparently, and come back and we had a meet with them in the arms. And that, that's all that was said about it. We, we asked why, and he says he was just a fucking nuisance. On the morning of May 9th, 1968, the Cray twins and other members of the firm were arrested by Nipper Reed and his team and charged with the murders of George Cornell, Frank Mitchell and Jack the Hat McVitie. The trial of the Old Bailey was presided over by Justice Melford Stevenson and became one of the longest and most expensive criminal trials in English legal history. When I started the investigation, I'd become a superintendent and posted to the murder squad. I'd made it. And then I went in to see the assistant commissioner, and he said to me, uh, congratulations, now Mr. Reed, he said, I want you to do the craze. I think we thought the best evidence probably was Cornell. If we, if we won that, and then went on to McVitie, the publicity that was associated with the first trial was such that it could be said we couldn't get a fair trial on the second one. And that was the arrangement that we said, well, we'll join the two murders and we'll leave Mitchell out and then we'll have a separate trial for Mitchell. And that's what we did. It was quite obvious they should have been tried separately. And not only did I, did I move the court, move Milford, he should try them separately, but I got him to stop the trial so that I could take the case to the Court of Appeal. They likewise refused. Backroom talk with the uh, Court of Appeal judges, clerks, the government behind this, and weren't gonna, the Court of Appeal weren't going to interfere. Really, it was the fact that, that these two murders were alike so in so much many ways because they'd been committed uh, by uh, criminals uh, who were who were conjoined not only because they were brothers and twins but because they were leading the same gang and that, that there was the same uh, motive or the, or the you know there was the lack of motive uh, that that uh, impelled us to say well there is a, a relationship between the two that can be established and it was ac accepted I think they had a good chance of getting off if they'd been tried separately. And I don't mean the two twins separately, but two murders separately. There were ten men in the dock. Only two, Ronnie Cray and Ian Barry, were on trial for the murder of George Cornell. The remaining eight men sat in front of the jury awaiting their trial for the murder of Jack McVitie. Ian Barry had to sit through the whole trial of the evidence against the gruesome evidence in the case of... McVitie. It was nothing to do with him, and s similarly, the other defendants like Bender, Whitehead, the Lambrianos had to sit through something that didn't concern them at all. And of course, in my view, it was tainted and pre prejudicial. I don't think it's happened since or whatever happened again. 
Well, it's one of the great trials of the 20th century. One of the great criminal trials. It's a great show trial. It was a mafia trial. And they did, kind of conducted like a mafia trial right from the very beginning when the police convoy brought them into the old bailey. Each of the jurors had a policeman to be responsible for him. The convoy coming up from, I think it was Brixton Prison, every day was enormous, sirens every day. It had been announced before the trial that it would take a different route each day for security. It was really the police, or the Home Office through the police, trying to pretend to the jury that they were likely to be mobbed at any moment by this, someone representative of this gang. And the mere fact that the leaders were all in jail and all on trial didn't mean there was, wasn't a big gang threatening them all the time. The security that was adopted in bringing them to court and taking them away was absolutely necessary. We were talking about uh, two people and a, and a gang who commit, committed brutal murders and there was no possibility that they could be allowed to uh, be conveyed to court in any other way. Oh, it's incredible. Sirens and motorbikes. I mean, they should start. We used to get to the Old Bailey in record time, 16 minutes, I think, from Brixton Print to the Old Bailey. These screaming sirens and motorbike outriders, the crowds are coming. There have to be crowds everywhere. And holding back 30 or 40 people at the end of the road, we don't go down there, it's too dangerous. We're, we're all in a van for a buck. I'm sure that the, the jury and everybody around it was affected by the heavy security. Of course it tainted the jury. I mean all the, the, the whole circus must have tainted them. Every single night the television would come on, the nose would be on the nose. Every single night. Now, that, I mean, it, it was a trial by publicity. Today, many judges would have reported newspapers and television for contempt. The craze, in my view, were killed by publicity. <laughs> You're convicted before you even kick a ball. Game, set and match. We made our own minds yeah, up. Yeah. That we're not going to be yeah. any part of them, which we wasn't. Yeah. And there's no way on God's earth that we're going to use their, so their, their barristers. And so we, we picked our barrister. And now it's a firm solicitor, a good solicitor. And, um, you know, yeah. we went our separate ways. It was established early on by his counsel that, that he was going to give evidence and the substance of that would be that he was under duress from the craze during the whole of this exercise and that that took away from him his freedom of action. Well, it's terrifying because um, there was ten of us in the dock and I was the only one there pleading for myself. The rest were as, as a mob. And um, I had to be really on my toes going in and out of the dock every day. I think really and truly there was so much evidence against them. The twins should have put their hands up and said, look, we'll take it. Because they was apparently offered the deal that you take it, like you put your hands up to it and all the rest can walk. They expected them to go down with them. That was their sort of, sort of like a death wish they had, you know. We're going down, you've got to come down with us, you know, we all go together. That's not right. Uh, they weren't really responsible for what the twins did. When each of them was arrested, I interviewed them and said, look, this is your one opportunity. You will never get another. I'm telling you now that I'm going to charge the craze with murder, and there may be other cases as well. You've now got the opportunity, if you choose, to come on the side of law and order, to make a statement to me, and tell me all you know about the craze, and this is the only opportunity you'll get. All of a sudden, you've got their own cousin, Ronnie Hart, done the right grass in any way, he's told them exactly what's happened, and about half a dozen more of the so-called heavyweights on the firm of all grass one another and grass the twins. Well this was a disgusting trial in that sense that the number of people who were singing, betraying, I mean it was really grotesque. And people who I'd met six months before 
as staunch friends, buddies, allies, whatever they were, of the craze, members of the firm, which is a, it was a load of nonsense. There was no really no such thing. It was a, they were a rabble. But um, all these guys, and suddenly there they were, you know, large as life, saying how dreadful the craze had been. I pleaded guilty because I had no chance. The charge was harbouring Frank Mitchell. And I told him never read what it was all about. And then he says, can you tell me about the Cornell? I said, yeah. From Ronnie's said, we got Scotch Jack is going to take Cornell's murder. Bronnie Hart is going to take Jack the Hat. And we want you to take Frank Mitchell. So I thought about it just for a few seconds. And I said, no, I ain't having that. Of course, you can't ask a man to do that. What man, what, what sane man's got to say, yeah, I'll, I'll put my hands up to a murder and get a life sentence for something I've not committed. I mean, it's ridiculous to, to even think it, you know. Of course, he had to roll over. The loyalty of all the other gang members is something that's quite remarkable. They did not want to dissociate themselves with the craze and in that way appear unloyal because... This was the structure. This was the society. We're loyal to the culture. We're loyal to the friends that we've always known, the people we drink with, the people we eat with, the people we piss and shit with. You understand? Not the craze. I put them before my own family. You know, Chris just had to go along with it, whether he likes it or not. That was a chosen I went down that road. And there was no going back. They didn't have to go down. They could have done what, they, what Albert done and what I done. They thought, well, the twins will get us off of this. They've got good lawyers, good barristers, plenty of money about. Plenty of money about for them. God knows what they paid. The rest of them had to get legal aid. The Minister of Disposable does not apply to someone who says, I never did it. It's as, uh, as one would say, there's an alibi and, uh, and self-defense. You can't have both. If he said, yes, I did it, then we look into what the state of his mind was at the time. But he always denied he did any of the offences. Justice Melford Stevenson was legendary for imposing long sentences with terse and often corrosive remarks. He had acquired a reputation as Britain's toughest judge, terrifying defendants and barristers alike. I thought he was just the judge for the case. I was very impressed by him because he, he brought no interference, he stood no nonsense and, and uh, he made sure that people knew that he was the judge, it was his trial and things were going to go as he wanted it and, and they did and I think the jury were very impressed by him. The first day of the tr 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 trial we go in there and the defendants come up into the, into the dock and uh, Mr. Justice Melford Stevenson actually has prepared, I think, six by six cardboard cutouts and expects each defendant to wear one round the neck with a number. I thought that was done purely to humiliate them and, in my view, very, very, very disgraceful. He decided to put numbers on us with pink ribbons. They said that they was confused with who was sitting in the dock. Uh, you know, they sat there looking at us long enough for six months. They should, uh, you know, they knew who we were, all right? He wanted to call us number one and number two and number whatever, you know? I was the first one to say, what do you think, are we in a cattle market here? You know, we to get these off, you're not putting that around my neck. They arranged that all of them on the count of three should take them off and throw them down. I remember them rehearsing this, telling us they were uh, planning this and rehearsing it in the cells. One, two, three. One, two, three. Firm down, boy. And unfortunately for me, my counsel said, Tony, don't take yours off. You know, because we're all like this, because I'll throw them. He said, no, 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 no. And he begged me not to part with mine. And I had to sit there with mine while all the chaps started tearing theirs up. I've been doing criminal law for nearly 40 years and I have never come across any case where any judge has behaved in that m m manner. I'm sorry to say judges are supposed to be the pillars of society 
He was a high court judge, and I think throughout the trial he treated everyone with contempt, besides the prosecution, uh, but he was, it was totally unfair. Oh yes, he, he tried to uh, undermine uh, our points and to underscore the points made for the prosecution. There was no doubt of that, but that was, that's within the scope of a, of a wayward judge anyway. If any good point was being said by defence or witness, the judge would turn to the jury and literally smirk and t turn his eyebrows up. Uh, things like that don't go on tr transcripts, unfortunately, and so it's very difficult to lodge an appeal on those g g grounds, but it happened. Everyone saw it. Well, you hear that, members of the jury? You know, not in a week, as it were. You see what they're after. You see what the defence is after now. That sort of comment. The judge was continuously rude to John Plattsmills, quite unnecessarily. And uh, I think it got to a stage one day Ronnie jumped up in the dock and shouted at the judge, you leave him alone, he's doing all right. The thing that struck me most at the time, which was quite odd, was the class aspect. I found something deeply unpleasant about it. It was much more than just a murder trial. It was as though the upper classes had rounded on these two upstarts and thought they'd teach them a jolly good lesson, which they did. I think Reggie was aware of what was going to happen to him at the trial. He certainly was. He looked absolutely haunted. He looked terrible. But Ronnie was as, as smug as a bug in a rug. Happy. I think he loved all the eyes upon him, yes. And you would have thought, I and mean, the way he came in each day, came up the, st the stairs and, and looked to the public gallery, I mean, as though he was in the theatre. I think he enjoyed it. He said something like, you can understand that if I wasn't here now, I'll be having tea with Judy Garland. Ronnie saw me from the dock, and he wrote me a little note, which I still got, because I thought it was so funny, saying, Dear Miss Lethbridge, you are more beautiful than ever. When I get out of this, I'm going to take you to the moon. Many a time during the trial, Ronnie was asleep in the afternoons, and he was asleep to the point that he, he was snoring. Reggie, on the other hand, was very intense and very uh, attentive to everything. Reggie went into the box and said that this was a conspiracy between Superintendent Reed and the Home Secretary to get the craze put away. Well, even if that was a thought, it wasn't, it wasn't the way to introduce it. He was always very particular throughout the case, before and after and during the trial, what the public th thought of them. He always was concerned. What did they say about us outside? Ronnie Cray couldn't make up his mind whether he was going to give evidence or not. And eventually the judge got a bit upset and said, Now, Mr. Platts Mills, is your client going into the witness box or not? And then R Ronnie shouted, I am going into the witness box. And in he went. And of course he made an utter fool of himself. Yes, Ronnie should never have got in, in, into the witness box. Um, because he just couldn't control his temper. Uh, you know, in cross-examination about anything, he would flare up. You know, he, he cut his own throat, really. Ken Jones said to him, weren't you known as the Colonel? Isn't that uh, a, a, a title that you've adopted for yourself? He said, that may or may not be, he said, but you're a fat slob. Jones stood there and just let it sink in, and let it sink in with the jury, I'm sure, because Ronnie was screaming and excited and just showing himself to be the sort of man who would on a whim shoot or knife somebody uh, and i'm sure jones enjoyed every bit of being called a slob at that moment ronnie was in the box melford said to him mr cray i think you've only said two things in the whole of your evidence the, the, the first is the prosecutor is a big fat slob <laughs> and the next that I'm prejudiced against you because I, I certainly am.
Mr. Foreman, I want you to ask me simply by saying yes or no. Have you all reached a verdict in the case of Ronald Cray in, in, in the first indictment? Yes. Have you reached a, uh, a second indictment? Yes. And then uh, went back to say, and then how do you find Roger? And he said guilty. And then he said guilty. And I was looking down like this, and I couldn't look up. My eyes were full of tears. It, it was a, a bit of a... You know, all the work that we'd done was justified. Ronnie Cray, 30 years. Ian Barry, 20 years. Ronnie Bender, 20 years. Reggie Cray, 30 years. Charles Cray, 10 years. Tony Barry, acquitted being under duress. Chris Lambriano, 15 years. Freddie Foreman, 10 years. Tony Lambriano, 15 years. Connie Whitehead, seven years. Well, the judge was uh, so carried away by the duty he felt he had to put down the whole tribe that he dished out to the lesser members as well. I never thought that Milford would swing with such violence. I wasn't surprised at the sentences in any way. A gang of people that had ruled the East End of London by a regime of terror and fear had killed people coldly, analytically, motivelessly, uh, in full view of, of other people, simply because they wanted to exercise their authority as gang leaders. Reggie would have been in a place like this. This is a, a cell, it's not wired and it's not long, and you never felt the cold until you've been in somewhere like this. He might have had a few photographs and pictures on the wall, a bed there, maybe he'd been allowed a bed cover and a radio, and that would have been his total existence. Day to day, that's how you live it. That's how you live it. You survive it, you come out of it. But you, you can never forget it. I've seen a man killed over a small transistor radio man walked by me and said, good morning Chris, and walked in the cell and murdered a man with a homemade knife in cold blood over a small transistor radio. What price life? He had his fights with the screws when they first went away. He tried to, he tried to kill himself. He, no one said about that, but he tried to kill himself because he was sick of the life he had in there. Yeah, I come to Mr. Long Larm Prison um, on two occasions, one, one twice in Parkhurst. I think it was a, a de de depression at the time. Um, I think I was on some medication and it's side effects, I believe, that done it. Side effects of the medication. Mm -hmm. Valium. Mm -hmm. I don't think he meant to top himself. I think it was a cry, a terrible cry. Uh, help me. A man who does um, more than 10 years is changed for the worse, forever, I believe. An ordinary man of ordinary capacity, I think, is ruined by it. You've got to have some spark of genius or maybe a political ideal. If Reggie Cray had expressed uh, complete remorse some years ago when he's 30 years old, then the probability is that he would have been allowed out. I think it was everything, the books and the films and everything that had gone around and I do believe that when they sentenced Reg and Ron and they sent them to prison and they locked the doors and they believed that they had well and truly thrown away the key and that the next step would simply be obscurity and in fact the, the exact opposite happened and the media interest grew and the public fascination grew and the Home Office found itself 27 years down the road with two men who, who had become incredibly famous. The idea of somebody who's in prison becoming the subject matter of a film is deeply unpopular. I think it's felt that somehow, even if it isn't financially, they will benefit. And benefit by the fame, if that is a benefit, by the notoriety. The last thing that anybody in prison needs is a high profile. And they were, to a certain extent, author of their own misfortunes. 
Among his writings were certain revelations that were not popular with other members of the firm, who were still serving long prison sentences. Four or five years later, he admits it. I dubbed it for him. What good was that to me or any other defendant, any of us? Nothing. Yeah, I was just a loser of it. Big sick about it. There I am sitting the nick for something that he couldn't admit before, and a couple of years later he comes out of it. Did we all go down for him to write a book? Ronnie Craig wanted a traditional East End funeral, and his family made sure his wishes were respected down to the last detail. Among the masses of flowers was a tribute from Reggie which read, To the other half of me. And then came the message from Reg. My brother Ron is now free and at peace. Ron had great humour, a vicious temper, was kind and generous. He did it all his way, but above all he was a man. And that's how I'll always remember my twin brother Ron. God bless Reg Cray. There's rumours. <laughs> I, I think Nipper Reed be able to tell you the answer to that. I would imagine that would be Teddy Smith. Teddy Smith was uh, a homosexual friend of, of uh, Ronnie's. And Smith suddenly disappeared. He showed up in the Regency, drunk as a skunk, shouting about Mitchell. We got him in the car, taking him round to the twins' house. And he said, stop the car, I want to want to take a leak. So he goes behind the house or something, and that's it, never see him again. You know, he's a frequenter, he was there every day, and then suddenly he just went off. And we made all kinds of inquiries, and people said, well, don't know what happened to Smithy. The vice the twins had, Reggie and all at times, was boys. That was their vice. Of course, we knew Ronnie was, you know, fancy boys. We knew that from the days of, of, of the early days when he when he told Charlie. He said, "Well, be quiet, this child." He said, "You might as well know." It. He said, "I'm bisexual." Well, Charlie was dumbstruck. You know, he, he looked at him. He went, "What? I can't believe you, mate." He said, "Well, you like men as well as women." He went, "Yes," he said. He said, if mother can cope with it, she knows, so can you. And he walked away. And, and that was the statement when he first admitted openly. I'm, I'm bisexual and I'm proud of it, so I don't care who knows. And Reggie was also bisexual. Being gay then wasn't like being gay now. It was sort of all have to be hid under the carpet type of thing. We was at a party one night in East End. And I went looking for my mate, Harry Abrams, and uh, he was with this girl. Anyway, I went in the wrong room. I opened the wrong door, and there was Reggie giving the young boy one. And I thought, God, and he just come out cold to me, Reggie, outside. He said, you're dead. He said, don't you breathe a fucking word of this. He said, you're dead. I think they, they being the, the macho image they had, they would like to me, they wouldn't show that side of their nature or their character. They didn't want me to see that. I never suspected Reggie. I thought Reggie's always been a straight guy, you know. I think he fought it in the beginning. I, I think, I think um, it came out when he was in prison more than anything else. He certainly liked the company of, of women uh, and um, he was debonair and, and I'm sure there's quite a few young ladies who've been to bed with Reggie, I can guarantee that. You used to train a lot in the prison. Did you stop that regime as a result of feeling ill? Yes, I stopped, stopped training hard. Um, when I got to Wayland, um, I still used to go to the gym, but um, I lost the incentive I had, um, not because I didn't want to do it, but because of the stomach problems. So I still trained over that period of three years, but um, it started to de decrease then. I still think it's the best thing to do in, in prison.
Over that period of years, did you feel you had something seriously wrong with I you? I definitely did, and I told him this. I definitely did. I knew there was something seriously wrong. It couldn't be otherwise. I was going to the toilet so many times a day, it was um, physically impossible, almost. And when I told them this, they didn't seem to... it didn't have any bearing on it. I said to him, you don't look too clever. But I shouldn't have said that to him. I should have said, oh, you're looking all right. You know what I mean? But you don't, you don't think. You just say what's on your mind. And he didn't look clever at all. He looked very ill. And he was. He had cancer. Do you feel that death is the only way they would release you? Do you feel they wanted to keep you in there? Forever? I think the way I was released wasn't satisfactory to him, but it helped to resolve a very bad embarrassment on their part. So that's the best thing. They got a good deal with it. They got a good deal. They found a way out, but I still feel in front of them. You don't see it at the time. Because I had a wife and a young child. And I had a son born when I was on remand. I was never to see him until he was 16 years of age when I come out. I had a daughter who was nearly six and was 22, and he's 23 when I come out of the nick. The marriage was over. My father became an old man, never knowing really what, 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 what had happened. You know, and the, the tragedy and heartache they left for all our families. What good came out? Where was the glamour and all that? There was nothing glamorous about it. We'd lost everything, really. We'd given everything up for them. Our future, our lives. Our club got ruined um, after the trial, within a matter of about months. Uh, the police revoked the licence and put us out of business. It's like the association, the smear did rub, it rubbed off on us. You understand? 1970, that was it, it was all over. It's really a Cockney tragedy. It's a very, very sad, god-awful story. The idea of it actually encouraging anyone, or anyone wanted to be like the craze, is another part of the sadness, because it's something sad in our own society, which makes heroes of people like this. But what better message can you put out to the, to the would-be gangsters of, of today, or are the criminals coming up? There's, these are the heroes you look up to, to the youth, and say, well, the, the, what, look what happened to them, the three of them have all died in prison. I find it hard to believe they're all gone, sitting here today. But they, it seems to me that that's the way it had to be, one or the other. It was a warning that if you do this, or you do that, this is what could happen to you. And I think that was, that was the message left here over the years. Prison life is a waste of time. Um, I get letters from all over the country, these kids write to me, and um, I advise them. It's very difficult when kids got nothing to do with them and they've got no money um, and they've got all kinds of social problems there. So it's easier to say than it is done. But speaking, speaking from my heart to them, I'd like to see them stay in prison. But whether they can do so, I don't know. Some will make it and some won't. Watching. If you enjoyed the video please join our Facebook group, it's called, Craze Crime Lords of London. We're a friendly moderated group with over 1000 Cray and other celebrated gangster videos available for view. There's also thousands of images in the photos sections. The link for the group is in the YouTube description section. I hope we see you there soon.